out the, to the end edge of the web, it's now starting to uh, dictate and to connect with organizations we know, governments, government departments, corporations, banking systems, and what have you. And its job is to take the spider's diktats and turn them into policy playing out through governments and other organizations represented in there. That's its job. And to understand the world, we need to understand two things. One, where do they want to take us? And two, how do they want to take us there? Or how are they taking us there? If we know those three things, we become immediately streetwise on a level never close to before. And where they want to take us is into a world fascist, communist, same thing, different name, world fascist, communist dictatorship, which would make Orwell wince. And it would be based on an enormous centralization of power. This starts to answer so many things about the world. When you are a tiny few at the core, and you want to control the many, you have to centralize decision-making. The more diversified it is, the less control any central point is going to have over those decisions. So what we've seen is an incessant centralization of power in all areas of our lives. And after a, 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 not very long and quite a way back now, it even got a name, globalization. Globalization is the centralization of power in every area of our lives. There's a man who actually has been given the title, the father of globalization. His name is Peter Sutherland, and he's in there now. Peter Sutherland was the first head of the World Trade Organization, which is, was designed and set up by the Rockf Rockefellers and the Rothschilds to uh, impose massive fines that force countries to open themselves to the merciless world market which they control. That's what globalization's about. We talk about free trade, Free trade? Oh, you must like free trade. It's free. Well, it's not. I'll tell you what free trade is. It's making your products for a few cents on the dollar for people in slum conditions. And then you take them across to the richer countries and you sell them for as much as you get. What free trade is, is freedom to exploit at both ends of the process. That's... That's what Peter Sutherland has been involved in for decades. Also involved in Goldman Sachs now, stands back in amazement. And so we've had this incessant centralization of power for a simple reason. And it's got faster for this reason. The more you centralize power, the more power you have to centralize quicker. And so the whole thing goes faster and faster and faster. And so, with the European Union, once we crossed the Rubicon of the Lisbon Treaty, they had uh, assembled enough centralized power within the bureaucracy of the EU to push it on faster and faster and faster as they have uh, since. So the idea is the constant centralization of power to this end. They want a world government which would dictate all global policy that meant anything. They would have a world uh, central bank dictating all finance globally. They would have a single electronic currency that uh, would have no cash for which there are massive implications for freedom. Look at all the, uh, the stuff now with the technology. You're seeing it. I, I was writing about this 20 years ago that it was coming. All these smartphones and stuff. Oh, you don't need to go in the bank anymore. Do it online. Oh, do it from your phone. They're creating the cashless society uh, based on a single electronic currency. And the cashless society means this. If you go into a store or a shop now and you uh, hand over 
uh, electronic money, a credit card, and the system says no, won't accept it, at least for now, though it's going out of fashion so fast, um, you can pay cash. Once cash is gone, that's the idea, then when that computer says no to your uh, electronic money, your microchip as they ideally want, then it's deciding if you can or cannot purchase. It's about control. That's what it's about. And you see, the, the euro was never meant to work because they want this single currency. They have to do it in steps. It means that they had all those European uh, currencies, the Gilda, the, uh, the Lira, the, the, uh, uh, the Mark and all the rest of them. Now, they had to get rid of them on the road to a single global electronic currency. So in comes the, uh, the Euro and it wiped them all away. Massive step forward to that goal I've been writing about all these years. Now, all they need to do is destroy the euro and, 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 the, and the world currency in general. And they'll say, well, what we have to do is we have to have a world currency to sort out this problem. Alongside the world government and world central bank and single currency, they want a world army to impose the will of the world government. Now, we already have a world government de facto. It goes under names like G8 to G20 and all this stuff, UN Security Council. We also have a de facto world army and it's called NATO, which imposes the will of these people. Send the boys in. So we're seeing it unfold before our eyes and still the mainstream media can't see it because it can only see dots and not pictures. And there's two techniques that are necessary to understand. Many people will be aware of these here, but I'll go through them for the mainstream media. Because <laughs> um, that's the thing you see. This is the thing. This is what the mainstream media do not understand in their bewilderment at what's happening is vast numbers of people are now far more informed about the world than they are. This is the point. The first technique I gave the name to a long time ago now, problem, reaction, solution, real simple. You want to change the world in a way that if you did it openly, there would be a massive response against it. So you don't do it openly. You first of all create a problem which you blame someone else for. 9-11 and, and, and all that stuff, a banking crash, a government crash, and you blame it on someone or something else. You then, here we go again, through a unquestioning mainstream media, you pass on your version of that problem to the public and you're looking at stage two for a reaction of fear, of anxiety, of do something, something must be done. And then you, who've covertly created that problem, then offer the solution to uh, the problems you've created. And those solutions are changes in society that advance the agenda towards this structure I'm talking about that would never have happened without the manipulated problem. There's even a version, Tony Blair's good at these. Tony Blair, yeah. Tony Blair! If, they, if there's ever a half-truth in a Blair speech, it's a typing error, okay? Um, but it's, it's a, a, an add-on to that technique, an offshoot, which I call no problem reaction solution. This is when you don't need a real problem to justify the solution, you just invent one. Weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Dead simple. Don't need a problem. Invent it. And alongside uh, problem, reaction, solution, its partner almost always hunts together what I call the totalitarian tiptoe. And then, again, dead simple. And my goodness me, that brings us back to this organization here. <clears throat> you start at A, as they did, and you know you're going to Z, you know where, where, where the agenda's leading. But if you go there too quickly, the changes in society are such that people look up and go, what's going on? What's happening? 
And, and so you do it in steps, as big as you can get away with, but not so big that you alert too many people. And so what we've seen uh, in the most classic example, which brings us to this organization, in, so the totalitarian tiptoe is the European Union. We have a European Union centralized bureaucratic dictatorship thanks to the Bilderberg Group and its manipulation over decades. The Bilderberg Group was created in part by a man called Joseph Rettinger. It just so happens that Joseph Rettinger was one of the major instigators of the European Union. And he worked in creating the initial common market with a man called Jean Monnet, who is still today called the father of Europe, the father of the European project. I have uh, a quote here from a letter by Monet, one day after I was born, April the 30th, 1952, right at the start of the European project orchestrated in so, so great a uh, part through this. And this is what Monet said in 1952. Europe's nations should be guided towards the superstate without their people understanding what is happening. This can be accomplished by successive steps, each disguised as having an economic purpose, but which will eventually and irreversibly lead to federation. This is not an accident. This is not, oh, we, we better have a Maastricht Treaty. Shall we have a Maastricht Treaty? It's all projected forward. And we have now reached the point in Europe where something like 70 odd percent of the laws that are introduced into this country start out in the bureaucracy in Brussels. That's how far uh, we have gone. And we've got a situation, the guy in there called Viscount Etienne d'Avignon, right? They love their titles, these people. You know, I reckon Mandelson must have had an, an, an orgasm for a month when he was made a lord, you know. <laughs> if, Ronaldo, Ronaldo, my lord. You're a prat. Uh, hey, I, 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 I can't take that guy seriously. Um, uh, and and I, I've got to say, a, 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 a non-stop orgasm by, by Mandelson. I just got a message, a message to my visual senses. Would you please remove the image I now have in my mind because it's bloody horrible, right? Anyway. The Davignon guy said a few years ago, when he was chairman of this bloody lot, that they were involved and in, instrumental in bringing in the euro. Leaked documents from the 1955 Bilderberg meeting in Germany show that they were talking about the common market at that time and where it was going. So, we have a situation here where the media are saying, oh, no, there's, there's no conspiracy. They're just meeting to have a chat. When the evidence is overwhelming that what is decided there comes down into, into policy that affects all of us. And we have a devastated fishing industry in this country. We have a devastated mining industry. And we have a devastated manufacturing industry because of these people over the decades. Maybe uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but it was proved when documents came to light under the 30-year rule of the British government when they released documents. Edward Heath, when I was a kid in the 60s, was never off the telly pressing us to join the common market. Edward Heath, major builder burger, uh, front man gopher for the House of Rothschild, especially a guy called Lord Victor Rothschild who helped to set this thing up. He